Well, uh, we do want to welcome, if you are visiting maybe for the first, second, or third time, we want to say thank you for being with us. It is our privilege to host you this morning. We pray that you just enjoy church. You feel like, oh, I could come back and do that again, and just, you know, believe that you walk out filled with faith and hope and expectation of what God can do. And so there is a connect card on the bottom of every single one of these worship guides. So if you would fill that out, uh, just whatever com- information you're comfortable giving us, uh, we would love to have a record of your being with us and just to say thank you for being with us. If you're watching online, we are so glad that you are watching, whether it's live or delayed broadcast. We just want to say welcome. Let's welcome our online audience, everybody. Yeah. Good to have them with us as well. Well, life is good. I, here's what I'm, I'm starting to realize something. We're, we're in a series, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this point, uh, we're in a series called New Beginnings. And if you haven't been able to, to kind of catch up on the series that you can go to the website connectingpointchurch.tv and we've, we've got all the messages there. But we kind of began the New Beginnings series talking about Jesus. We said, what, are the, what was the first thing that Jesus said when it came to his public ministry? And he kind of ushered in a new way of relating to God. And so we, we looked at Jesus in the world, Jesus in the church, and Jesus in you, and how he initiated something new in every one of those areas. And then we kind of, we looked at uh, New Beginnings, Navigation the unexpected. How many of you have ever had an unexpected in your life? And just some keys, some principles, and how we can navigate those things well. A uh, couple of really important ones. One is just to, to focus more on Jesus than on your circumstance. And if we can do that, keep a heart of appreciation, keep relationships a priority in our life, and understand problems can sometimes turn into, and many times in God, turn into an opportunity or into a blessing. Maybe not feel like it in the moment, but, uh, but it can happen. Then last week, we talked about new beginnings. Now what? Like the new beginning thing happened, and what do we do now? Well, it's faith, and we have to live with faith. Why? Because new beginnings require more. They require more focus, more attention, more faith. And so last week was a bit of a faith message, and I'm excited to preach today our final wrapping up our series on new beginnings this morning. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your grace, that you are a good God. I pray that you'd be with us this morning. Let your word help us grow into all you've destined us to become. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What I was starting to say earlier is I think I finally figured out what people were saying when they were saying, you know, it's 90 degrees, but it's not hot yet. So please tell me it's now legitimately hot. Do we have any? Okay, thank God. Because I was starting to get worried like it was going to keep on going and going. But no, we've, I've been really impressed because I've watched like in the neighborhood people who have uh, just kept on doing their routines, like people out running, just around the neighborhood, and I'm driving, and I think, oh, man, good on you. Uh, 100 degrees, that's no joke. That's really impressive. Do we have any runners in the house? Anybody who likes to run? (laughs) You you are my friends. (laughs) All of you. Uh, The three people who love to run, uh, good on you guys. That is absolutely amazing that you're out there doing your thing, running. Uh, You know, runners, they're kind of a whole subculture when it comes to uh, that activity. It's it's a pretty cool thing that you can see. Look, people, they get together to do running clubs. Uh, they kind of help each other pace and, and do those kinds of things. Uh, you know, if you've ever run, and I'm not, I wouldn't qualify myself as a runner. I have run on occasion when I'm scared. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But I have run, you know, usually as it connected to a sport or something like that. But there is this thing called hitting the wall, right? The, where you're running and, and you just, you kind of hit, hit a wall. And it's that, that moment where fatigue sets in in a huge way. And this thought comes in and says, I can't do it. I can't go on. I can't keep doing what I'm doing. In life, I call that the middle mile. And it's that moment in life where, where things aren't going, which when the, the excitement of the new beginning has waned, and yet the joy of the finish is still a long ways out. It's the middle mile. It's where, that, where frustrations can be uh, amplified, where, where you're doing it, and you just, you know, you feel like you're in the middle of a grind. You don't know how it's going. I don't know if I can keep this pace. I don't know if I can keep on going. It's the middle miles of life where things can get a little bit tough. The reality is that middle mile is a hard yard moment for all of us. Where you're in that moment, you're not sure if you can keep on going. You're not sure if you can keep pressing forward. 
It's a place where apathy can creep in, where the voice of doubt gets a little bit louder and louder and louder in your mind that where you've got to keep on renewing your mind, believing. But it's also a place of incredible grace that we can find in Christ. The world tries to, to categorize the middle mile and things like uh, midlife crisis. Have you ever heard of that? Like a midlife crisis? Or the seven-year itch when it comes to a marriage. Like there's a reason why we say the vows when love is in the air, the aroma is wonderful, you're not dealing with messy people and smelliness on the floor months later. But it's in the middle mile where those very vows will be tested. And I've never met, I've done a lot of premarital counseling. I've never met a couple coming in saying, man, you know what? About six months, maybe, maybe five years, we want to get a divorce. Like we want to get married now, but I know we want to get it. I've never met a couple where that has been their end in mind. And yet 50% of marriages plus a little bit more end in divorce. Middle mile. When the vows are tested, when the moment is tested in our life where we've got to just make decisions. Here's the thing. The middle mile is when we find out what we really believe. If we really believe all these songs we've been singing for months, right? That's a middle mile moment where you go, what is really in me in the middle mile is what's going to come out. So when you face things in life where you have maybe an unexpected tragedy comes in, maybe your finances aren't what you thought they ought to be, and the question of, am I going to continue to trust God? Am I, am God, am I going to continue to tithe? Am I can, going to continue to live with a generous spirit in the midst of a challenge, in the midst of difficulty? Maybe a, a son or a daughter who isn't serving God. Those are hard yards. And sometimes we don't like who we're introduced to in the middle mile. I know in my own life, I can say there have been times in a middle mile where I look at the mirror, and I'm talking to this guy, and I say, man, how could you think that way? Well, I don't really like what's coming out. And that is a result of what we've been investing in ourselves, in our heart. You know, the middle mile, listen to this. It's the place between the promise and fulfillment. We sang it. God can be faithful to the promises. We can hold on to his faithfulness. But there is that moment where we've been promised something. We're believing for something. And the fulfillment of it is way out here. It's in that in-between, that tension. Am I going to stand in faith? Am I going to keep moving forward? Am I going to keep believing? Here's the thing. Last week I mentioned King David. King David waited 15 years between his anointing to be the king and him taking the throne. In between, he had a lot of heartache. He faked insanity, joined the enemy, got together with a motley crew of people who were depressed, discontented, and in debt, and they became his followers. I mentioned Joseph last week. It was 23 years from when Joseph dreamed the dream that his brothers would bow down to him to where the fulfillment of that dream and that actually came to pass. 23 years. That's a big gap. Noah waited 120 years between the rain and building the ark. Like the prom- rain is going to come 120. Can you imagine building an ark for that long, waiting for the rain 120 years? Now, he lived, obviously, a lot longer, but I'm hoping to live 125. I keep joking, Heidi. Anyway, just teasing a little bit. Abraham waited 25 years to get his promised son. And then you have Moses, 40 years, his first 40 years in the desert before he went back to lead the people of Israel out to then stay again 40 years in the desert with the people. He was with sheep, and then he was with people sheep in the desert for 40 years twice. 80 years, that's a long stretch of time. Middle mile. It's hard. It's challenging. Listen to this, what John Maxwell says. It says, more important than the awaited goal is the work that God does in us while we wait. Waiting deepens and matures us, levels our perspective and broadens our understanding. Tests of time determine whether we can endure seasons of seemingly unfruitful preparations and indicate whether we can recognize and seize the opportunities that come our way. I want to say this. If you're experiencing the pain of the middle mile, you are in good company. If these great men experienced 
those middle mile moments, I can promise you I can be the bearer of good news. We will too. So don't be discouraged. Shame off you. Understand it's part of the process, part of living this life, part of walking in faith. Inevitably, each and every one of us are going to come into a moment of a middle mile. And you know what? For our lives, you can be in different stages. You can have a new beginning in one area of your life and a middle mile in another area of your life. For example, I mean, we're in a new beginning here as a family. But Heidi and I have been in ministry for 25 years. So you're kind of in the middle mile there. So it's a new beginning in one case and a middle mile in another case where you, and all of our lives operate in the same way, where you have seasons, one season is a middle mile season, in this area and another area, it's a new beginning and exciting. And then eventually that new beginning becomes a middle mile as well. And so we got to learn how to navigate those things in a cool way. So the first step is this, number one, is to pace yourself. Life is not a sprint, it is a marathon. So we've got to learn how to pace. You know, I mentioned those running communities, they'll come alongside each other, they'll encourage each other, they'll find a pace that works for all of them, and they just stay in the pace. You know, I once, I said, I'm not a big runner, but I have run a couple half marathons. Thank you. In Virginia Beach, we had this marathon called the Rock and Roll Half Marathon. And my good friend, Larry Vandery, who uh, actually ran cross country in college. Bad omen from the start. So he, he would always do this as a fundraiser thing for uh, the organization he worked with. And so, man, I want to I wanna do that with you. So he's like, oh man, great. We'll train together. We'll run together. We'll do it all together. So for months, I would go running with Larry. We would run through First Landing State Park. And you know, I, I said, I'm not a runner, like a runner's runner. I'm like the, the guy they tolerate in that, you know, we're always having to encourage. And so we trained for months and months and months. And even one day, one day, I thought we ran like 16 miles. And so later we were in the lobby and I was bragging about our run. Like, oh man, we ran so far. It was so amazing. We did like 16 miles. He goes, oh yeah, really? Where'd you run? He's like, oh man, that's like, that's like nine miles, <laughs> bro. So I was like, oh, I was, I was deflated in that moment. Well, we get to the day, rock and roll marathon. I'm so excited. New beginning. I'd never done a marathon like that or a half a marathon. I'm super stoked. We get there, and Larry ends up being like six corrals ahead of me. So they had all these people in corrals, and he was at like five, and I was like at the way back because I was with the slow people. And I thought, man, I need to catch up with him. We're doing this marathon. Like, he, we promised we were going to run the marathon together. Surely, you know, so I'm, the, the, the marker goes, out we go. I start sprinting. It's a half marathon. I start sprinting, thinking in my mind, I'm going to catch Larry. I'm running so hard. By mile two, I am toast. And I am not even close to Larry. I have spent it all. I've got 11 and a half more miles to go. It was a brutal middle mile. But the best thing about it was in that race, they had bands lined up the entire course. So as you were running, walking, whatever you, I was running, but as you were making your way, doing whatever you were doing, they would be playing band, you know, big songs and cheering for you and all the rest. And the only thing that really kept me going was like, one, I can't totally humiliate myself. And two, like the encouragement of the people, the crowd of the community around me, encouraging me. Well, that is a great picture for life as well. And that's the value of community. That's the value of point groups. I'm so excited about our fall launch of point groups. So if you're interested in maybe leading a point group or being in a point group, we'll have these all over the city uh, that you can get involved in building relationship, discipleship, leadership, having, great, having a great time, fun, authentic, going to be good. You need community like, this is great. This is, and it's great. We have to do this. But we, as we get bigger, we also have to get smaller. And the way that we get smaller is getting connected into a point group. And so this fall in September, early September, we're going to be doing that and moving forward with uh, point groups. It's going to be a lot of fun. So our next key in pushing through the middle mile is to rely on your training. Paul oftentimes linked 
this value, the, the connection between the picture of physical training and its value and spiritual training. And so I'm going to read you a couple passages. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 8 says, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 says, Do you not know that in a, in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Don't tell me Christians can't be competitive. Paul just told us we could be. Anyway, I thought, it was, I thought that was going to be funnier, to be honest with you. <laughs> I won't do that in a second. All right, number 20, 25. Everyone who competes in games goes in, in strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. I, no, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be dis. Qualified. You know, it's in that middle mile where things like nutrition, mental endurance, physical endurance, all those things come into play. And your training really, really does come out. I love Paul's language here because Paul's not, he's speaking in a language that is very intentional, right? I, uh, listen to it again. He said, uh, strict training. I do not run aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. What he's saying there is, in the same way you train physically with intentionality, you've got to train spiritually with intentionality as well. You know what? As a church, we take that charge very seriously. Like, we ought to see you growing. Making a decision for Jesus is a great step, but it is the first step in a lifetime of growth and discipleship and growing in your relationship with Jesus. And that's why I'm also excited. We're going to start in August our next steps. And so we're going to do classes where you can learn how to connect. Uh, just kind of hear the story of, of connecting point and then discover, discover your gifts, develop your leadership, and then find out where you can serve. And so right here, connect, discover, develop, and serve. We're going to do that. And those classes will run all the time. And beyond that, I think there's another step in terms of intentionality that will we'll unfold in, in later days that, you know, to, to grow, to maybe do a little more in-depth teaching, I'm not going to teach deep, deep theology on a Sunday morning. There will be a place where we can teach that. And people who are hungry for that, they can get it uh, in some classes that we'll offer in the days ahead. But we take very seriously and understand you are not just saved, you are saved and called. Being saved is that, that moment of decision where you're making a decision for Jesus and then being called into something greater in terms of your growth and relationship and ultimately to help to serve other people in your journey. And so we take that pretty seriously. All right, so how do we grow? So we can be intentional and get in, in a class like that, go through the next steps. But here's some other ways that we grow. Prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Now, I don't know where you're at in your journey, but prayer should be a part of it. Now, some people relate to God most naturally, like they're they, they inter intercessors by nature. Prayer is how they grow. Other people kind of relate a little more in a worship setting where, man, worship just, when I'm worshiping God, He speaks to me in a way that He doesn't when I'm doing other things. And some people, it's just reading the Bible, man, just hungry for the Word of God. We've got to grow intentionally. And then through community. I know a lot of people, and most people I know who have grown, gone on to do great things in God usually had other people like a Paul and a Barnabas and a Timothy where you have this tension of I am being led, I am uh, a follower, and I'm a leader. I'm helping someone grow and someone's helping me grow where there's always that tension. There really is a Christian always ought to be that kind of a tension in our life where we're growing, but we got to pray. We got to read the Bible. We got to worship and we got to be involved in community. We've got to be intentional about those things. At the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, your training comes out in the middle mile. And far better to have years and years and years of deposits of God's word in your life, of his promises in your life, of community around you, that when the middle mile comes, you know, hey, I've got gold on the inside of me. I've got the, the spirit of God speaking life into me. I've got Jesus interceding on my behalf. I've got promise. I've got community. I've got encouragement. Far better that than to get into a middle mile like I was realizing, hey, 
I didn't run that race the way I trained. And I paid a high price for 10 miles, running, running, running. Here's what I required of myself, and sometimes life can be like this too. I got to the place where all I required was one more step. I mean, just one more step. Just, just one more. If you just take one more step, just one more step, just one more step, and just requiring myself to say, I can do one more step. If I can do anything, I can do one more step. And as you keep on taking that one more step, eventually you get to the place where you finish the race. And it's the same thing in our spiritual walk. Sometimes it's just saying, God, I can only do one more step. Guess what? That's okay. Because many, many little steps eventually will lead you to the place where you are beyond the middle mile. You start to feel the excitement of what God is going to do as he pulls us out. The next step in pushing through the middle mile is to just run your race, right? Listen to what 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says. It says, do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They are not wise themselves. I just added that last one because there's so many in there. So we've got to learn to run our lane. You've got to find out what your lane is and run it. Great runners aren't overly distracted by everything around them. They're running. They're focused. They're running their race. They understand their skills. They understand their gifting. They understand their calling. And they're just running their race. What a great lesson for all of us. You know, I, w- I would hope that you don't watch the band up here. And I'm, just, I'm so proud of the team. They're doing amazing, amazing. Yeah, we can give them awesome. But I hope, I hope you don't watch Caitlin and think, man, I wish I could sing like her. Or Taylor, oh, I wish I could, or I could play keys. Like, I, no. Like you're, you are unique. You are a gift to the body of Christ just the way you are. You don't have to look and think, oh, I wish I could. No, there is gold in you. There's a deposit of God in you. And you have the ability to use it in church, to serve people, to help people, to help people grow. So don't look and think, oh, I wish. You know, in Corinthians, it talks about, the Bible addresses this. I mean, Paul talks about, we're one body. And so you don't want the the thumb saying to the toe, I wish I was that. We need a whole, we complement one another. And I would encourage you, don't hold your gift out. Go all in. Serve people. Love people. Let's grow together. We, you know, if I've learned anything from marriage is that Heidi compliments me in a way that only God could have orchestrated. I'm one way, she's another way. Her thinking challenges my thinking. My My thinking challenges her thinking. We grow together. And the church is the same way. We're called to grow together. And you are valuable. You're important. As we do those next steps, part of the goal is to, to, let's build our serve team. Let's have an overflowing team of people where we just have people committed. Like, I want to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus. I have a place where I can serve. I promise you there's a place for you in the body of Christ to be able to use your gifts and to run your race. And I even think about, think about me. Like, I'm me. I'm the best me you're ever going to meet. But if I tried to be somebody else, it wouldn't work. Like David tried to put on Saul's armor, and he said, yeah, this doesn't fit. It's not, it's not going to work. If David goes out to fight Goliath in Saul's armor, he doesn't return. But because he went out who he was, his little <laughs> boom, knocked him out. You know, did the, the deed. Gained the victory. You just got to learn, hey, I'm going to be me. You're going to be you. You're the best you anybody's ever going to meet. Don't try to be somebody else. God loves you. He created you. You were awesome. Look at your neighbor and tell him you were awesome. Then give him another high five. <clears throat> what do they say? Just do you, boo. Is that what they say? <laughs> It's so bad. I know. I just had to try it though, right? 
There you go. All right, our final step is this, that we have to run with vision. We've got to see the prize. You've got to see the end in mind. And eventually, you'll get that second wind. You'll get that burst of energy you didn't even know you had, that deposit of, oh, we can do, we can finish, we can make this happen. Now, I remember when I, I ran that race, I sprinted at the beginning so stupidly. But at the end, I remember, I felt like, oh my gosh, I can see the end. And I thought I was running so fast. I, I was burst of energy. I was running and I finished. I was so proud of myself for finally finishing the race. And at the end of the race, they did these photos, right? I don't know if they, they do these photos, photo cam things. And I thought, oh, I'm going to send this to my brothers. <laughs> I finished the race. I'm going to show off a little bit. So I send this photo. I hadn't really looked at the photo. Didn't look at the timestamp. I didn't look at the picture. Oh, I wish I had. So I, I send them the photo. And they email me back and say, hey, who are the old ladies in front of you? <laughs> and I was like, you know. The beautiful, beautiful ladies doing a, yeah, the race. But in that moment, I, I went from like, oh, I finished to, oh, yeah, there you go. But it was, I thought I was going really fast. Evidently, maybe not quite as fast as I, I thought I was going. Here's the thing. You've got to run with vision. Sometimes you say, I have a discipline problem. Sometimes we say, you know, I just procrastinate. You know what? Most of the time, those problems aren't discipline problems. They're not procrastination problems. They're vision problems. Do you have clarity of vision? Do we have clarity of vision of where we want to go? Because when we do and we can see it, you can tolerate a whole lot of middle mile mess when you know the end is better than the beginning. When you know this is where I want to go, this is where I believe God has called me to go, this is where we're going to go, when you can see it, you can press through a whole lot of stuff in the middle mile when we live and walk with vision. I would encourage you, sharpen your vision. Ask God, God, help me. Help me to see. Help me to see what I haven't seen. Help me to think new thoughts. Help me to pray in a way I've never prayed before. Help me to see what you can do. Here's the thing. There are aspects of God that we will never find any other place than the middle mile. Now, you can have a great relationship with Jesus. The reality of our Christian faith is that it's when everything is great, when everything is going the way it's supposed to go, when everything is doing what it should be doing, or the people in our life are doing what we think they ought to be doing, we're all happy. That's, that's like easy street. The middle mile is the testing of our heart. It's the testing of our faith. It's the testing of our vows. It's the testing of our commitment. This is what Mark chapter 6, a beautiful story of Jesus walking on the water. It says in verse 45, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethesda. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went on up to the mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of, in the middle, right? In the middle of the lake. And he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because all, they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Isn't that amazing? In the middle of the lake, you know, it was on the other side were a bunch of miracles. Here we have his disciples in the middle of the lake struggling like sometimes we struggle in that middle mile. I want to encourage you this morning, if, if you would say, Jason, man, there are some areas I'm in a new beginning, but there are certainly areas of my life where I'm feeling the strain, the tension, the pressure of the middle mile. Listen to what Jesus said. It is I. Do not be afraid.
God would say to you this morning, don't be afraid. I am with you in the middle mile. There is grace in the middle mile. Don't be afraid. Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, Jesus went through a middle mile as well. It's called the cross. In Hebrews, it talks about, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, the humiliation and the pain of all of it. Why? What's the joy? You. You're the joy set before him. Why would he endure all of that so he could bridge the gap between us and God? That's why. Because he loves you so much. His vision was so great. That he did it for us. Jesus endured that middle mile for you and for me. You know, I don't know how you came into church this morning. I'm very confident of this, that God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not condemning you. He's not ticked off at you. He's not looking at you, hoping you screw up so he can add one more thing to your plate. God loves you. He endured his middle mile so that we could walk with freedom, so we could walk in relationships, so that we could grow in Him. If you'd say, Jason, maybe I, I, I once knew what it was to walk with Jesus. I once knew what it was to have a relationship with Him. But right now, if you would take an honest evaluation of your heart and your life, I'm not talking about praying a prayer. I'm not talking about coming to church. But do you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus? And if you can't say yes, I'm talking to you. Maybe you'd say, Jason, I've never invited Jesus into my life. I've never asked him to come into my heart, to forgive me of my sin, to walk in relationship with him. This morning, there is no condemnation. God loves you. He is for you. We're going to do something in just a moment. We do every week in our church. We won't embarrass you in any way. But we do want to pray with you. So if you'd say, Jason, yeah, that's me. I know for certain I need to make right my relationship with God. I need to come home. I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to commit my life again to living and loving and serving him. I'm going to ask every head would be bowed and every eye would be closed and just a moment, I'm going to ask you, do you know him? Do you know what it is to be forgiven of your sin? Come home. Jesus loves you. He's for you. So this morning, if you say, Jason, that's me, I need to invite Jesus into my life. Just raise your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. We're going to, I see a hand over there. Others this morning, I see a hand there. Others this morning who would just say, you know, I need Jesus. I need to come home. I need a relationship with him. I need the hope and the promise that you talked about today. I see that hand over here as well. Others this morning, if you just give me a wave, high enough and long enough for me to see it. We're just going to pray with you. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. Others this morning, come on, why don't we give God a great round of applause for those who did make that decision today. So great. We're going to celebrate every week, every time someone makes a decision for Jesus. Well, we're going to do something. I, I, I want to encourage you. I mentioned the Connect card earlier, uh, but on the bottom of the worship guide, there's a little card here. We would encourage you. you know, we want to do everything you will let us do to help you move forward in your relationship with God. The first step, first next step, is signing up and just saying, hey, I made a decision. Also, Heidi will be at the back. If you're interested in the next step classes that will start in August, if you've recently made a decision or if you've been recently been water baptized or new to the church since we've been here or even maybe six months prior, I'd encourage you to just come through the next step process. Uh, you can sign up out at the Connection Center where Heidi will be to, to kind of greet you and say hi and get you signed up for that. It's going to be great. Really going to be a good thing. And so we're going to pray, pray a prayer this morning, and then we've got something really, a couple more special things we're going to do. Why don't we just pray this? prayer with me. And why do we do that? Because I just don't want people to feel alone. We're a family. I want them to to know, hey, we're standing in support with you. We're going to, we're going to do life together. So just pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. I invite you into my heart. 
to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting hope in my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.